Okay, well, good afternoon if you're on the West Coast. Good evening if you're on the East Coast of the of the North America. And my name is Mitch Weisberg. I'm here for EdChat Interactive. I'll be, for the most part, behind the scenes tonight in our session on leading collaborative learning with um, Lynn and Beata. I'd like to now just bring your attention to the fact that we have two more events coming up this week. Tomorrow we have an event with Zachary Walker. This is his fourth EdTech Tools and Tips session and this one is going to be on video and as you know you can find video, you can curate video and you can have students create video and he's going to be talking about different techniques to incorporate video into your classrooms. May 11th Russ Qualia is going to continue with his series he has a monthly series on school voice conversa conversations, which encompasses uh, student voice, teacher voice, and starting very soon, parent voice as well. And then next week, we're going to resume our uh, game-based learning series with a session on uh, with, with Lucas Blair, who's going to be talking about three game development techniques that any teacher can use in their classroom. But without further ado, I want to uh, bring up uh, Lynn and Beati because they have this is uh, there's so much and collaborative learning is so important in education. Let me bring you two up right now. Good evening. Hi, Mitch. <laughs> Hello, Mitch. Hello, everyone. Hi. So before we get started, just you're going to be going over a lot of techniques on on how to promote collaborative learning in, in your schools. But maybe how did you get into the field of collaborative learning in the, in, in the first place? We've uh, Beat and I have both uh, been practitioners together in uh, senior leadership positions in a school district uh, here in Ontario, Canada, for many years, and. Um, we know that uh, school and system implementation starts with a strong relationship building. So we explored and we continue to explore that um, collaborative practices uh, research that shows it makes a difference in collaborating to increase student achievement. So it's in our life work, if you would say. Yeah. Well. Okay, so uh, I know uh, we were rehearsing a little bit earlier, and there's a lot of information, so I'm going to pull myself down, and I'll pull your slides up. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So welcome, everyone, to uh, this webinar this afternoon, and uh, we're really excited to uh, be trying out uh, the platform and very uh, appreciative of the opportunity that Corwin has given us. So we're going to uh, go through uh, our experiences and uh, also talk a little bit about our research. Next. So we have uh, together just published the book, Leading Collaborative Learning, Empowering Excellence, and it uh, was published February this year, 2016. And you'll find that uh, we're talking about uh, the book as an overview uh, today. And within the book, there are many uh, examples and vignettes, case studies, uh, and how to template to conduct collaborative learning in your school or system. So over to Viata to uh, start with our definition. Thanks, Lynn. And uh, we think it's really important to start with a definition because collaboration is a word that we all use freely and uh, we feel that we've been collaborating in our profession uh, for as long as uh, we have been working in it. But we know that the form of collaboration that we need to significantly improve practice for teachers and ourselves as leaders as well as uh, outcomes for students uh, needs to be very focused and we look at the word collaboration and see that co-laboring within it and uh, we have defined it to be uh, a co-laboring where we're, we're responsible for our own learning and, and continue to always be responsible. But we also see ourselves as being accountable for supporting the work of those we work with so that it's an interdependence and negotiating meaning and relevance together. Thanks, Beata. 
during our time together, we're going to uh, go into detail in five different areas. So uh, first, our research. We'll talk about the research, as Mitch asked us uh, today. What, what drove us to, uh, to do this research, and what did we find? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, we, we had four questions of inquiry, and we're sharing two of them with you. Uh, we wanted to really uh, delve deeply into the perceptions people held about the leadership behaviors that build readiness for deeper forms of co-laboring or co-learning and collaborative learning, and what are the tangible steps to get to that kind of a culture? So those are two uh, key questions for us. And next, and uh, we had over 500 participants, which was exciting for us, uh, through uh, questionnaires, uh, which included both multiple choice and open-ended items. Uh, we had great response through social media, and also through our personal and professional networks, and we also held interviews and informal conversations. So we had a lot of data to analyze. Next. So the perceptions that were shared, it was interesting because we had an international group. And across countries and continents, there is a, a, a con some consensus on what collaboration in our schools should be all about. It's about hope and practice, and the perceptions that collaboration is growing was really heartening to see. But we also heard from people that collaboration that was not clearly articulated, that did not have a clear purpose or focus, was difficult to move forward. And so the role of leaders, both formal and informal, uh, was really key in models, modeling co-learning. Next. We also heard reality checks from people and concerns being expressed. And in many cases, people told us that, yes, there was some strong collaboration going on, but it was in pockets within the school or within a school district. And these pockets of collaboration were often separate from each other. And there were issues of ego and also a lack of trust. A risk taking is very difficult in an environment if there is some sort of anxiety or fear underneath that. So we know that there are some underpinnings to strong collaboration that we need to attend to as leaders. Next. So our theory of action in terms of the research uh, really begins with an assessment frame of mind. And that is that we, we really um, feel that to get to that our strong, articulated focus on collaboration, we have to begin with a clear focus and that we get that through analyzing the impact of our teaching on student learning. It's about assessing to plan and planning to act. And then through that thoughtful action, assessment and action we call that, um, moving to that continual cycle of reflection. And we, this particular theory of action we know is applicable to every level of work within a school district and a school. Next. We had 10, uh, ten uh, key themes, and uh, you see four of them on the screen. Um, I think it's realistic uh, for all of us to understand that collaborative learning is an, a journey, and that journey comes with a professional disposition about collaboration. We can't underestimate, to the impact of leadership, and leadership in particular that is skilled in the area of facilitation. And keeping our focus as adult learners on what the impact is on student learners keeps our work on track. And so we've come to a murmur moment, and, and Mitch is going to assist us a little bit with this murmur moment. If the questions that we'd like you to consider are up on the screen. I wonder if you could uh, just have a read of those, and we're going to ask Mitch to assist us. Okay, so there's really uh, three different ways that, uh, that, that you can participate in this. One is if you uh, click on the avatar of another person, and I see a couple of you are already doing that, which is great, uh, why don't you discuss this 
with another person in the room and that's probably the most interactive format but also if you don't have a video camera and you have your IM window open and remember you can you show you show your IM window by bringing your cursor over your avatar and there's a uh, there's there's a menu item IM and you start putting in some of these answers into the IM window and then you can discuss them with the other people in your room and then finally you can just reflect on these uh, if if you, you don't want to type in to the into the remarks but I these are uh, key questions that will help you prepare better for the material that follows so I'm going to pull myself down and we'll give you oh I'd say about two minutes um, and if you might be able to find um, uh, Beata in this also so if you, you could actually click on her icon and talk to her about these as well uh, to talk to her and Lynn so again I'm pulling myself down and in two minutes uh, we'll come back up and, and resume okay I don't I didn't see that there are too many people typing this into the IM window so I'd like to encourage that but let me bring back um, Beata and Lynn so very often you, you go through these sure you, you go through these questions also when you go into schools and help them develop a culture of collaboration so what are some of the things that you thought that people might be discussing from this question Well, uh, when we go into schools, we uh, first do uh, a needs assessment where folks are in terms of collaborating and uh, where they want to be. And then we determine what are the steps to get from where they are to, uh, to where uh, staff members would like to be. So, and, and also, and beyond, what's possible beyond. So, we do that analysis. So, we'd be hearing from folks right now about what collaborative processes they have in place and how are they working and what are areas of need that they might uh, be seeking our help on interesting very interesting okay well i'll bring i'll bring the slides back up okay thank you So Beata talked about our research. I'm going to talk a bit about our practice. Uh, Beata is going to look at uh, the leadership components of collaboration. And I'll finish with what's the impact of collaboration. So let's take a look at the five strategies that I mentioned in terms of practice. Uh, how is uh, collaboration the foundation for increasing all students' achievement? And you'll see that we believe that um, collaboration is a continuum of learning, that we move from a model approach where leaders and teacher leaders and teachers are modeling collaboration to a place where we um, see collaboration as deeper learning, as learning from each other, learning alongside each other, and co-laboring, as we've said. And uh, these five strategies on the screen at the moment are the ones that we're going to uh, discuss in, um, in some detail, certainly not as detailed as we, um, as we do in our con consultation work with uh, school districts and uh, schools. The first one we'd like to talk about is the collaborative assessment of student work. And um, this involves uh, what we call in Ontario teacher moderation. And uh, in order for this to be effective, we need to have operating norms in place and protocols for teachers working together around uh, discussion tables with um, a piece of student work that they've brought to the table and uh, a collaboration on understanding deeply the meaning of the piece of work and how to respond to level, not only leveling the work but giving descriptive feedback to the teacher about what will the next level of instruction be and also to uh, students what will the descriptive feedback be to the students about this piece of work. So for us the collaborative assessment of student work builds trust, builds knowledge and confidence in teaching and learning together. The 
second uh, collaborative process that we feel really strongly about is the case management approach. One of our parameters that uh, Michael Fullen and I have written about in putting faces on the data. And the case management approach is two prompt. First is the co-construction of data walls that lead to, secondly, case management meetings where we put faces on student work, bringing the student to the table and understanding as a group around the table what the student needs as the next steps to learning. So each of these um, prongs of the case management approach have collaboration as an underlying or foundational um, concept in order for it to be a, to, it to be an effective approach. And the third uh, one that we want to talk about today with you is um, the 4C. And uh, we each have been involved in 4C's work for a very long time and find it a powerful strategy to hear student, um, hear student voice through teacher's voice teachers sitting uh, at the table, co-planning, and then co-teaching, co-debriefing, and co-reflecting. And you can see from the uh, graphic on the screen that we've used the same graphic as the, our theory of action in the book. So this theory of action is foundational for us in terms of collaborative processes. So you can see from the four Cs, we start with co-planning together, we move to uh, one teacher volunteering to co-teach the lesson that has been planned. Then moving to co-debriefing, and that is thinking uh, together about what worked, what didn't work, what would we do differently. And then finally, looking at co-reflecting. What have we learned? What, what practice? How can we refine our practice? And again, that leads to a new inquiry what we want to learn more about in terms of uh, our teaching practice in classroom. And, uh, and the fourth area that we want to talk about is collaborative inquiry. We feel strongly that, again, um, this theory of action, the four-step um, uh, cycle to inquiry, applies uh, in co-teaching and, and the four C's work and apply it applies to our theory of action in collaborative learning, and it also applies to collaborative inquiries. Collaborative inquiries at the system level, at the school level, and in the classroom. So the cycle continues and is foundational to our learning. And always, as you can see uh, on the slide, assessment in action is our driver for our inquiries, for our collaborative work. Next. And finally, uh, the fifth strategy of many strategies that we have uh, in our book and in our work is learning walks and talk. This answers the question, how do we know that students are learning? And it's through the collaboration between teachers, teacher leaders, and leaders that we um, are able to not only answer our questions, how do we know students are learning, but we can find answers in our classrooms to what are the most effective teaching strategies to uh, ensure that all students are learning. So learning walks and talks are really a collaborative process of collecting data on how well we're doing, how well we're leading, and making uh, that impact on student achievement. You can see from the screen that it's very important that learning walks and talks are collaborative and not evaluative. They're not judgmental. They're walking to look for evidence of professional learning. They're walking to um, really look for questions that we want to know more about mm -hmm. as instructional leaders. And we can find the answers to those questions in our classrooms. And you can see uh, during learning walks and talks that we ask students five questions, and they're on the screen. In a three to five minute cl uh, classroom walk, 
Uh, we won't have time to interrupt teachers or ask teachers the five questions. But eventually, there might be times that leaders, after many walks in the teacher's classroom, want to ask an authentic question to know more about the teacher's practice, to learn from the teacher. And here are some questions as well that we feel teachers will want to discuss with each other in terms of that 4C cycle, co-planning, co-teaching, co-debriefing, and co-reflective. These are the questions that teachers ask each other. So that's some um, five <coughs> of the strategies that um, teachers and leaders use to collaborate and co-learn. And uh, we feel that each of these strategies um, is a powerful strategy to uh, ensure that, te that teachers and students are learning and growing, and that leaders as well are building collective capacity. So let's take a look at now at the leadership that um, is needed to ensure collaboration. Yada, over to you. Thank you. And if we could have the next slide up. <clears throat> um, leading collaborative learning uh, is, um, you know, obviously adds the complexity of how the adults in a learning community take on the responsibility not only for being a co-learner, but also the accountability of facilitation, um, the resource management, uh, mitigating challenges as they come up, and also supporting the learning of others. And that uh, obviously requires leaders, informal and formal leaders, uh, because many informal leaders are hugely influential in our schools. It requires leaders who know how to model for others how to involve adults in sharing and guided practice as well. Next slide, please. So how we lead matters, uh, because it's through how we lead that we create the conditions for co-learning. And co uh, we, we really see collaborative leaders as being change agents. And we know that that comes with a lot of responsibility, but it also comes with um, wonderful challenge and a dynamic learning environment. So if you could, thank you. And in our research, we actually probed for those leadership behaviors that create that culture and that readiness. And you can see uh, our, our participants were very, very um, strong on the fact that you know, leaders have to know how to build strong relationships. But they also need to know how to articulate uh, why that collaboration is important and to model that growth mindset. We know that partnering with staff is a, a huge part of creating that environment. So the, there was great consensus on the leadership behaviors that uh, really move that work forward. Next, thank you. So leaders have to consider certain conditions. And also, who are the informal leaders in our schools? Who are the natural facilitators? And how do we give them opportunities to develop those skills even further? What kind of mentoring and coaching support are we as formal leaders providing for those folks? Are our aspiring um, school leaders being given the opportunity to access some facilitation skills training? Because that will serve them very well. And are they also um, accessing opportunities to become strong in the analytical areas of analyzing student work and data? because student work becomes the center for developing some shared beliefs and understandings. Thank you. So there are four major challenges that we put on the table. Time is a huge one. Uh, even with some of the strategies that Lynn was talking about, we know that leaders have to be creative in how they use time. Is there going to be a resource time given, or are we going to facilitate ways for people to get together to work before? Uh, and during and after a school. Are there opportunities for facilitation skills? The absence of leadership is, uh, is an area which is definitely a huge challenge for, uh, for teachers who want to collaborate. Uh, if someone drops by um, just to see people working, that's cheerleading, but it's not co-learning. Mm. And then how do we take fear and anxiety out of the equation? Thanks. So 
leaders as co-learners and co-learners as leaders is really at the in, the center of the kind of work that we are describing and at, was at the center of the research itself. And so, um, as you can see, we reinforce again that assessment in action, that responsive action that comes through that work is a huge part of it. And what we do for adult learners becomes something that we want to translate for our student learners as well. So it becomes a learning community in a true sense when we're modeling that kind of co-labor ability. Thank you. So it's really vital, as we said, not to have a judgmental uh, approach. In fact, um, collaboration is best served when it's voluntary and a dynamic collaboration draws others in because they can see the impact. So we have to separate evaluation processes. We have to find time. We also have to find support for staff who are struggling. We have to make it safe and make sure that we are attending to those operating norms that set the um, sort of road forward. Uh, operational norms really help, and we use protocols to structure the work and keep it on track. So here are some sample questions for leaders who wish to become more skilled in the area of leading collaborative learning. Um, certainly these are questions I think as you go through them that really talk to the heart of leadership itself. It's that ability to put yourself out there, but also to support others in their learning along the way. Thank you. So we're up to another murmur moment. Uh, and uh, Mitch, if you could assist us here. Thanks. Great. Uh, thank you. So here's, here's another time where uh, we'd like you to reflect and, and interact with the other participants here. Um, so the question on the screens is, what are the collaborative processes which you feel had, have had an impact on student achievement? What counts as the evidence of this impact? So what we'd like you to do is, uh, first of all, if you, um, if you, I see a number of you are doing this already, is, is talk about these two questions with at least one other person in the audience. Um, if you don't feel comfortable doing that, please uh, type in, uh, some collaborative processes, process which you've seen has had an impact on student achievement, type that into the IM window. And, uh, and the third thing that, that you can do is um, I'd mentioned that there's an ask button. If it's something that you'd like to uh, share specifically with, with me, uh, you can put it, it's not technically a question, but you could put it into the format of a question by just clicking on ask, typing it in, and then I'll see that and I can pass the information onto Beata and, and Lynn. So let's give you um, let's give you a couple minutes to discuss this. Uh, what are the collaborative processes which you feel have had an impact on student achievement? And um, how do you know that? And I'll pull, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll get us back up in about two minutes. Okay, let's, um, Let's just discuss for a second. So what what are some of the examples that you've seen in terms of uh, collaborative work which has had impact that the, some of the practices that you've seen from teachers? Um, <clears throat> thanks, Mitch. Um, well, one of the things I would I, I certainly want to highlight is that I see teachers being far more precise in their teaching decisions once they have had a chance to kind of co-analyze the impact of teaching. I mean, you know, it's very much our second nature to second guess ourselves. And then when we're working with a peer and you're coming to some consensus about uh, what struggles a student might be having and how to respond to those struggles, it builds confidence and it builds uh, our skills in personalizing for our students. And that gives us a sense that we're being more precise. And obviously, the ultimate test is, is the student going to do better as a result of our co-work together? Mm -hmm. Just, I, you, you, oh, go ahead. Sorry, Lynn. I was just going to say that um, I think uh, one of the impactful strategies for me is co-construction of data walls. When the data set is not a large uh, scale standard-based assessment, but actually when the um, 
data wall is constructed by teachers who have a question they want to know more about and they bring um, a common assessment and they assess that how uh, student work together and then they put the work on the wall and the student <coughs> work becomes the basis of the of the students and mm -hmm. what happens after the wall is co-constructed is a magical conversation among teachers about practice like oh look at this student what's student doing? Well, this student's only uh, in grade two, but performing in this writing piece at a, at a grade five. What, what are you doing with that uh, grade two student? And how um, are you going to bring that student to the next level when, when that student is performing at a high level? So data walls just don't uncover struggling students, but we look at um, students who are stuck, students who need extending, and the rich conversations are the collaborative foundations of, um, of the inquiry and wanting to know more about our practice and what can make a difference for each faith. So it's funny, as you were talking about the, um, the, the data wall, I would, it, kind of was, it was actually answered another question, I think, answered another question that, that was going through my mind. And that is, uh, you stress so much that you want to keep the conversation collaborative, but I can just, I've been in a lot of conversations that didn't feel collaborative at all. It was like, what do you mean you're telling me I'm doing this all wrong? But it's, it seems to me that by focusing on something external like a data wall, rather than focusing on what I'm doing wrong in the classroom, you're changing the whole conversation so that both of us are focusing on something else. You're not, we're not just focusing on what I'm doing wrong. I would agree, Mitch, and I would also say that when we have a data wall up of, say, 10 students that we're all collectively worried about, we all own all those students' faces. It's not about my class versus your class. It's about all of our students, and we want them to do better. We want to know more about what makes each student uh, grow in terms of their learning. So it, it's not a competition, it, it's a collaboration among teachers who are genuinely wanting to know more about uh, improvement for each phase. So that's really what you were saying earlier that I just really, really got, which is uh, focusing on the student, uh, that having a conversation focus on the student because it changes the whole structure is you say it's not my students not your student we're just we're here to help students do better yes and it's about um, instruction it's about assessment which is key for us in collaboration it's about assessment that improves instruction so mm -hmm. it's not a competition it's about learning together and if I just interject for a second mm -hmm. Mitch before we move on it's also where the value of those norms, operating norms, comes in and the protocols that keep those conversations respectful, always come back to a clear focus, and where the leadership uh, comes in in terms of modeling that kind of engagement. That's interesting. Well, so one of the things that I was most excited about in, in looking through you know, your book and the slides is the demonstration of how much impact this has on student learning. And it seems to me you're about to start talking about that as soon as I bring myself down, right? How did you know that? <laughs> Just a gift. <laughs> thanks, Mitch. Uh, thanks a lot. And so our fourth area to uh, chat with you um, about is impact. By now, uh, it's important you're all asking the question. So, does collaboration uh, make a difference? What's the impact? And uh, we can see from the screen that there have been many studies uh, about uh, collaboration. But I must say uh, that um, Michael Fullen uh, and John Hattie and Jim Knight, who uh, each write a part in our book, pushed us in terms of the so what. So what difference does collaboration make? What's the proof? What's the evidence? What's the impact? So you can see um, we did certainly did our homework around um, those questions. And uh, we have many studies uh, in the book that talk about the evidence that collaboration makes a difference to increase students' achievement. And uh, on the next slide, you'll see that uh, 
Michael Fullen and Andy Hargraves write about the power of collaborative work uh, in their book, their 2013 book. And um, Michael Fullen uh, writes the afterword, Jim Knight writes the foreword for us, and John Hattie writes the introduction. So we knew that we had to, in each of our chapters, point to the impact. What impact is this um, making on our students? So we uh, first began with provincial or state impact, and we looked at the evidence in Ontario. And uh, you can see on the screen that um, our educators across um, all of our provinces point to not only increasing students' achievement, but also the underpinnings of collaboration. And uh, in Ontario, we talk about that as um, collaborative professionalism. So, uh, we've uh, worked very hard with our Ministry of Education here to identify what are the um, foundational pieces of collaborative inquiry. What does that look like at a system level, at a school level, and in a classroom? And we've now uh, been able to uh, research, write about it in the province, and also see the impact in the student achievement results. Next. So um, it's important to know that from the beginning of our work, uh, in uh, collaboration and focused collaboration in 2002-2003 to, to 2013, we've seen 150,000 more students reach the expected level. And uh, this is a result of uh, focused collaboration across the districts in the state, in the province. And uh, the fact that there's consistency of best practice, and that teachers, teacher leaders, and leaders can all talk about uh, their practice, why they're doing what they're doing, and how they're doing uh, the practices with not only each other, but also students, parents, and elected officials. So it made a huge difference uh, in our results. So that's our first uh, impact example. We can now say that um, through this work that modeling collaboration impacts teaching, impacts teaching practices and in turn increases students' achievement. And we can also say that planning for collaborative inquiry enables students to own their own improvement and become interdependent stewards of everyone's learning. The next example uh, is from a district school board. And we see the uh, outstanding achievement that's uh, been gained in the district that we've uh, both worked in. And uh, for us, um, this achievement comes from the consistency of practice across our classrooms in every school. And so we can say in the next slide, that um, it has been because of teachers co-laboring, co-laboring with each other, with teacher leaders, and with uh, leaders, that um, the increase in our student achievement has been as profound as it has been. Next. So the work for us is uh, intentional and purposeful. And uh, we know that if collaboration is purposeful and seen as purposeful by teachers and leaders together, if the work is relevant and um, it's a valuable use of time, then practice is transformed and students learn. So issues of practice cause teachers to reflect on changing their practice uh, that result in increased student achievement and growth. So it's not only about achievement, but it's also about the growth uh, of student learning, taking students from where they are to where they need to be and beyond where they can become. It begins with 
that foundation of collaborative learning. So we've thought about uh, a state and uh, we've thought about a school district. Now let's turn our heads to looking at a network of schools. And uh, this example of impact comes from Australia, uh, New South Wales in Australia, where their um, grade nine results have uh, soared because of the collaborative uh, practices they put in place with school teams working with other school teams at the district level and, uh, and then in their network. Next. And uh, we know from networks uh, across a region that um, the huge impact that collaboration has is evidenced uh, in student results. And uh, as Beata has said, it's about making time for that collaboration. It's about having a common purpose. And it's about working together, which creates that relationship building that we need. So it's everyone rolling up their sleeves, not um, not being uh, the leader and the workers or the followers, but actually being together in the work, no matter what the leadership position um, is that one holds. So uh, we see regional evidence. And finally, we see uh, school evidence. And this is another uh, interesting uh, piece of uh, evidence that shows impact at a school level. And again, coming from uh, Australia this time, we can see that um, students in literacy and uh, particularly in reading and in writing have improved uh, uh, in, at many levels, have um, shown the growth. And if we turn to the next slide, uh, we really feel that through the evidence that we've shown, at the state level, at the regional level, at the networking level, and at the school level, we can say that um, collaboration makes a difference to increasing students' achievement. And you can see here that the principal of this particular school has said that st staff was very clear on, their on the expectations that leader had uh, for teachers working together, learning from each other, with a focus on each student's face. So um, for us, this is a quote uh, from our text, that our ultimate goal is uh, deep learning for professionals and for students through the thoughtful uh, collaborative learning opportunities. That are, um, that are available and the strategies that we've talked about in our text uh, that really create greater success for all. And I think that we talked about earlier that if there's somebody who's participating now who would like to talk about any of these points or talk about what's going on in their school, um, that they should raise, you know, click on that raise hand button and we can bring them up and they can talk with you. So I'd like to encourage somebody who, um, you know, click, click on that raise hand button, which will indicate to me that I can bring you up on stage. And uh, it's it's fun. I've talked to uh, Lynn and Beata before and they don't bite and they're collaborative and they're non-judgmental. Um, so, uh, so we, we, you could talk about the students. So somebody, um, uh, it would be great if, if, if somebody would, in the meantime, um, you know, your data comes from all over the world. Do you all, do you travel all over the world, uh, helping schools or are you based yes. primarily? Yes, yes, we do. And, um, it's, uh, it's very exciting work. And it always begins with relationship building and trust building. And mm -hmm. uh, it evolves depending on the school context. And uh, we begin with the um, gap analysis, where the school is, where they would like to be. And then we add pieces as we go along and um, collaborate together 
on uh, what's possible. So we do go many places. Hmm. And I'll just add, Mitch, that you know we, we try to model in our own work that um, the teaching is a learning profession, and it doesn't matter if we're the principal of the yeah. school or the superintendent of the district. It's a mm -hmm. learning profession, and we need to be prepared to support each other's learning and to be co-learners throughout our career. And I think that's been a guiding principle for both mm -hmm. of us, and we've been fortunate to work with many other wonderful co-learners. Now, you, you brought up, when we looked at the obstacles, one of the obstacles was time. And obviously, if people's day is already filled up doing things, and now you were just going to layer on one more thing called collaboration, uh, they may not have that time. So what's, what gives then? Is this adding one more thing to their to a person's day? Yeah. Well, we probably both have uh, thoughts about this because time always uh, is an issue in all of the research we do. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the things we say is that there is no more time in the school day. And so we need to restructure the time we have. So that will mean, um, you know, serious consideration of what's working, what's not, and culling what's not working. Um, the other thing I think we feel strongly about is that the collaboration uh, with other co-learners needs to happen in the school day so that it's not seen as an add-on. It's not something that we do after school or before school or at lunchtime because then it's really not um, always going to be there. Somebody's going to be missing for lots of good reasons. But we know that when it's uh, time during the school day, we're really serious about it. And uh, if it's focused and pur uh, purposeful, then it's time well spent. So leaders have to be really creative about timetabling. They have to be creative about using whatever resource dollars they have to facilitate that kind of co-learning. Uh, it means facing some hard questions about whether or not we're um, uh, sort of perpetuating activities versus learning opportunities. Because we know uh, teachers are very busy people, uh, and yet it does take some hard conversations about how do we actually find ways through partnering, through uh, using our, our precious uh, time that we have for planning, how do we use those precious minutes in a way that furthers our own learning on a continual basis? Because I, I I'm gathering that we're all, as when people go through this, they're surprised at how many activities um, are just being done because it's always it's always been done that way. Whereas when you actually think about them, you you end up freeing up. A lot of the time for things that are much more effective. Yeah, and you know there are also um, there are also many jurisdictions now that have professional learning community time, and mm -hmm. so I think that's a very precious gift, and uh, that's a place we can look at how that time's being spent, and are there ways that we could um, structure a PLC so there is time for co-constructing data walls, for case management meetings, for the four C's work, uh, mm -hmm. for uh, collective uh, moderation of student work. So we have, we have a volunteer. So we only have a few minutes left, but I do want to give Steve a chance to, to come up then, which, which will be great. And so um, you, now you can, um, you can model collaborative learning with Steve. I'll bring myself down. Good afternoon or good evening, everybody. I'm Steve. I'm in Vancouver. I work at the Francophone School Board here in BC. Um, you know, we've had, uh, you know, I had the privilege of um, of, uh, of facilitating last week or, or a few weeks ago um, work on collaborative learning in our schools. You know, this is something we really have to work on in, in the Francophone School Board. Uh, work about how to collaborate together and one thing we have um, we have issues with is finding times like we you know we're talking about and you talking about the PLC time and um, you know we've I find some I find some district in BC we've planned we've put this in their schedule you know every Monday they have or every 20 Monday per, per year they will have um, one hour of collaborative time on those Monday and the kids will be released from school earlier and they um, 
they they can work in during those hours to do their collaborative learning but and i'm wondering about the ontario experience um how do you justify this collaborative time to parents or to the school the school administrators and to not not uh, but you know that the uh, you know those people the people in their district um, the conseillers the, the councillors they who are who are elected people how do you justify to these people that plc time is important it will benefit students in the classroom so that's my question that's a that's a great question steve um and certainly uh, we use research to justify the time. So for us, our uh, Ministry of Education uh, has written some monographs about the research uh, behind collaboration. And uh, we, so we uh, have research uh, reading for folks to do that show uh, what a difference the collaboration makes. I think we have to start with the impact um, we use John Hattie's work around uh, impact. He now has added a tenth mind frame uh, to his work called um, teacher collaboration. So um, there are many researchers plus our own work uh, that really justifies the time spent on collaboration. So I'd say that's one way. And I would add, hi Steve, I would add that um, I've had the uh, good fortune of working with uh, very skillful principals who have um, shared their learning journey with parents, with their parent council, to the point where the parent council is interested in helping to fundraise for professional lease, uh, release time for teachers in some settings. And that I think is because they've been transparent mm -hmm. in the same way we are in the classroom about helping students with identifying their learning goals and what those success criteria will be. These principals have also shared with their parent community what we are learning to do and become better at and why it's so important that we have that professional disposition mm -hmm. of co-learning and what the impact then is in our classrooms. Yeah. It must follow through, uh, obviously, that there's evidence in terms of rich learning environments for students as a result of rich learning environments for adults. I hope that helps. Yes, yes, it does. And the thing, one thing I've heard uh, some people talking is that they, you know, they, the, um, they think that you, oh, you, we're going to give you collaborative time, but we don't really you know, like they, they don't think we're going to work collaboratively. Like they don't trust with work. But one thing I appreciate about your uh, your work is that you know, if you know that for collaboration to work, you need facilitation. Yeah. And without facilitation, it's something difficult to establish and. I've, I've worked with inquiry groups before, and it, I'm a trained facilitator with my union. And I, you know, I go into groups and I facilitate work, and I find it so important. But doing this in, um, inside a school it sometimes can be challenging because you know you have already dynamic established in the school, and um, yeah, but it, it's definitely something that is needed in our school. More facilitation, and not only coming from the principal, but from teacher leader as well. Uh, Steve's um, idea of the importance of facilitation is a great way to end uh, because we couldn't or that facilitators set um, the operating norms and the protocols for the time, the collaboration time together. And using protocols is the beginning of a whole new conversation uh, and those facilitation skills uh, are another one. So you can see all we, we can do in an hour is scratch the surface of something that uh, I think as education, as uh, professionals, we will continue to learn about ourselves. So I, I know you had uh, actually two more slides, uh, where, one where you, you put your contact information, but we're going to be sending out the slides to people. And then you had a final slide where you talked about uh, our, our session, which continues the Corwin series on May 23rd. Uh, which is a great title, Life's Too Short for Long Division, <laughs> uh, with Linda Gojak and Ruth Harbin Miles. So, um, you know, so I'm, I'm hoping that, that people can attend those as well. Um, do you have uh, closing, anything you'd like to close out on? Any takeaways for people? Um, I, w I would just say that um, go for it, take a risk, and uh, 
go into uh, collaboration, uh, building trust and relationships as the work continues. And I would and, say, uh, yes. I would just say that you know we want our students to be critical thinkers, and I think those opportunities to push our own thinking uh, through collaborative work is uh, is just as important. Uh, so thank you, Mitch, for this opportunity, and uh, we've we've enjoyed chatting with, with everyone. You know, and we're talking, and I just forgot the name of your book again. What's the name of your book? Leading collaborative learning, empowering excellence. And, and where can people find it? Thanks to Corwin for this opportunity too. Corwin, so people can, uh, mm -hmm. 2016, it's available from Corwin. So people can find it on the Corwin website or probably on some online booksellers as well, right? Leading collaborative learning. Well, I I um I, I really enjoyed talking with you and um and and it's also really interesting how in the book, uh, you know, and and tonight, but in the in the book. Uh, there are so many practical things that both teachers and teacher leaders, I say both, but it's three, teachers, teacher leaders, and principals um, can do to establish a whole culture of collaborative learning in their schools. So thank, yeah. thank you so much for the work that you do. I really enjoy talking with you and hope to see you soon. Thanks a thank lot. you. Thanks for all the preparation. Yeah. Thanks to everyone who participated today. Yeah. We appreciate your support. Yeah. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Okay, this is Mitch Weisberg. I'm uh, signing off for EdChat Interactive. We have two more this week, and we hope to see you at one of our events this week. Uh, good night, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are. Take care.